Robert Daly is director of the Wilson Center's Kissinger Institute on China and the United States. He joins us today to talk about big meeting taking place in China coming up in the next couple of weeks. Uh, let me ask you first, I was thinking about this, Robert. Mm. If you were going to explain the Party Congress to someone from the West who had never heard of it, right. is there an equivalent? Is it like the Democratic or Republican National Convention? No. Is there anything like that? I don't that? think there's any analogy that works because this comes out of the Leninist system of government that the Chinese borrowed from the Soviet Union when the Chinese Communist Party was formed in 1921. So as soon as we start talking about these communist systems, I think a lot of people's eyes glaze over because we're talking about uh, party congresses and plenums and plebiscites, and it, it's all pretty dull. Oh. This is a particularly important meeting. They have these national congresses every five years. This one, more important than most, because it raises the question of what Xi Jinping, the leader of China, the Communist Party General Secretary's second five-year term will look like. Will he carry out reform? And will he, this guy who's concentrated so much power in his own hands, seek through one means or another to go beyond the second five-year term to extend his leadership? Those are really the big questions, and we can skip a lot of the mechanics about the various governing bodies within the Communist Party. It's really about Xi, right? It's about Xi, and it's about China, and it's about this bigger question of this party that was formed, again, a Leninist party, borrowed from the Soviet Union in the 20s, which then comes into its own in the Cold War after 1949 in a large, desperately poor, agrarian, authoritative, revolutionary country. This kind of party, how can it possibly fit the needs in the 21st century of one of two great superpowers that is increasingly wealthy, urban, integrated, internationalized, and educated. And yet you're saddled with this old system, which she has tried to consolidate and make even more powerful in traditional ways. How can it serve the needs of China? That's really the broad framework people should look at. Robert, who are the delegates and how are they elected, right? They're elected, not They're selected. They're not really elected. Nominally elected. Some of them from small towns are nominally elected from slates of Communist Party members that are presented to the people. So. The National People's Congress is not really a legislative or a representative body. It does have various ways of listening to people. They want to be responsive to constituents. They want to fill potholes. Mm -hmm. uh, they want to be seen as, as meeting people's needs. But in fact, they're all working within the Communist Party system, which is directed from above, from Beijing through Byzantine, again, Leninist means. And so you're going to have about 2,300 delegates who will go to China, and this is, this is the part where you get a little bit of mechanics. Those 2,300 delegates to the Congress are going to vote. It's not really a vote. They will be rubber stamping 200 members of what's called the Central Committee. And this is the smaller body that makes decisions. And that 200 me member Central Committee, this is the boring part of this that I was gonna leave out, will elect the 25 Sorry, people. Yeah, yeah, the 25 people in the Politburo. And this is, these are, these are the big dogs. This is where policies really can get hammered out. And then those people will vote to confirm the members of the Standing Committee of the Politburo. Nominally, that's what happens. In fact, over the past several months and years, Xi Jinping and his group, uh, through processes that are a black box to us, have been setting the table for all of this. It's determined by now through private processes, which will be confirmed at the Congress. Is there a State of the Union aspect to this in that it, they take stock in how the country's doing? Yeah, I think that, now that, that may be the analogy that you're looking for, and that Xi Jinping will give a very long discussion, a very long speech, which will be nationally televised and will be carried in the newspapers. And long by Chinese standards be, is lo, this, hours? It, at least two hours, and maybe twice that, we'll have mm. to see. Um, he's a better speaker than a lot of his predecessors, but he will review his successes and challenges of the first five years and will try to indicate directions for the next five years. And because most Chinese don't want to sit through this either, what will happen then is at the direction of the party, the big newspapers, the Xinhua News Service, the People's Daily, will give you a summary, the greatest hits, here's what to pay attention to. And yes, that is something like a State of the Union, an outline for the next five years. And how, how is uh, the president and, and the Politburo feeling about where China sits in 2017? Well, this we don't know. Uh, we don't have polling. We don't have elections. What we do know is that Xi Jinping has consolidated more power than either of his two predecessors. Uh, this guy is all about control, and there are various theories about what that means. 
Does this bespeak a deep awareness of fragility in the system and his sense that you need a strong man to knock heads and to keep everybody together? That, that's one idea. Another idea about Xi Jinping is that he needs control because only with uh, full control of the party and the media, academia, the security services, the army, can he have the standing to do the really difficult next phase of reforms? And what that means, for example, is breaking down the state-owned enterprises, these massive, again, uh, Maoist era, Soviet era, very inefficient companies that don't have to compete, that drain a lot of resources and that really become a sort of a social safety net for the people who work there. He needs to force them to be competitive. Now, he knew this coming in five years ago, and he hasn't done it. So the question is, is he going to prove to be a reformer in his second five years? It, it, this control impulse uh, we've seen in preparation for the meeting, a, a sort of preemptive crackdown right. on potential dissidents or protesters or even uh, media. Uh, who is that show for? In other words, what is all of the concern about how this will look? Is this for an international audience or is it for an audience within China or both? So it's mostly an audience of, first, the Chinese Communist Party itself, secondarily the Chinese people. The international audience is far less important here. This is largely a domestic Chinese affair. We'll look later about policies uh, that may affect the United States. But no, this is for the party and this is for China. And these preparations, these crackdowns you've spoken about, they're really only an acceleration of an ideological campaign that Xi Jinping has been carrying on since he came to power five years ago uh, that has affected universities uh, where he is uh, cracking down and requiring more political training, uh, more ideological work from faculty. It affects think tanks. It has affected the Chinese media. Xi Jinping famously said all Chinese media, and this is Xingdang in Chinese, it means they are all surnamed the Communist Party, which means they are mouthpieces, they serve the party. He's also given speeches, again, early in the five years, not in the run-up, to creative classes, authors, film directors, uh, saying that you must serve the people. This is the Maoist approach to culture. And we had just last week one of China's top filmmakers, Feng Xiaogang, his new movie, widely anticipated to be released this week, during the Chinese National Day Golden Week, was inexplicably pulled out of the theaters, and we had the director in tears uh, at his press conference, not knowing why this was happening. And so it's all about Pulled control. indefinitely, or? Remains to be remains seen. Remains to be seen. Uh, so it affects even what's on television, what's on the screens. So uh, is there anything appro approximating dissent within the party hierarchy? So this is, this is a great question. Because of what we know about the history of the Chinese Communist Party, uh, which has had factions. There have always been various voices and there have been behind the scenes struggles, at times bloody struggles in the history of the party, uh, recently uh, less bloody, uh, but still quite brutal. So we know that the party has been riven by factions and you would expect this because China faces very, very difficult challenges and there are different schools of thought on how to approach them. We also know uh, that there has been some split between the second generation Reds the sons and daughters of the founding generation who she represents and what's called the party school, the, the, the up uh, by their bootstraps, the people who came through the system. There have been some suggestions over the past 10 or 20 years that that was a rough breakdown. And we also know that Xi Jinping, through his anti-corruption campaign, has probably made a lot of enemies and alienated people. And so there's this idea that there are factions and there's opposition to Xi, which in theory we think must be true. But nobody can point to the source of this opposition. Who might these people be specifically? What might this party, what might these interests be? We don't know. It appears right now that this is going to be the Xi show, that he will largely be able to run the table. Uh, he's already been named as the core of leadership of the party. There is a chance that this party Congress will give him an even more elevated title, something like Ling Xiu, which Mao Zedong had, but nobody has had since. And there's also a chance that uh, Xi Jinping's thought, his governing philosophy, uh, whether there really is such a thing or not, will be written into the party constitution as part of its guiding thinking. No leader has had that while he was still in power since Mao Zedong. So these are the kinds of things we'll be looking for. In, in addition to these she-centric outcomes that you're, you're describing, are there any other outcomes you would anticipate that would be announced or anything that we would know about? Well, there will certainly be a description of the, the plan for the next five years, and it will certainly involve further economic reform, what the Chinese call reform and opening up. And it will include plans perhaps to open other sectors to foreign competition. We will probably see a reiteration 
of uh, the previous party Congress's plan, this was in late 2013, in which Xi Jinping famously said that he would let market forces play a determinative role in the distribution of resources. And that was pretty widely hailed in, in China and overseas as really addressing China's needs and as being a good guiding slogan for the next phase of reform. He hasn't done it. Yeah. He's gone largely in the other direction. And so some people say he's, he's fake left, go right. He's getting all this power because then again, he can make this move to reform. My view tends to be that's unlikely. After five years, this man has a record. We know him. Uh, political power in China, as in the West, is an appetite that tends to grow with the feeding. And his ideological campaigns and the other moves that he has made bespeak uh, either something like paranoia or a well-founded fear that there are more fractures in the system, that the system is more fragile than many people realize. And that speaks for more control over the next five years, not less. But we'll see. I learned a question from a, a documentary producer who teaching a class that I took once. Mm -hmm that when a generalist is interviewing an expert, that a good question to always ask is, is there anything I haven't asked you about about this upcoming Congress that's important for us to know? No, there, there are other issues that people uh, who are trying to lay bets, they want, they want you know, there's, there's an old uh, parlor game of whether you can accurately predict who will be named to the standing committee of the Politburo. In particular, there's a guy named Wang Qishan who's been running the anti-corruption campaign who, according to recent party tradition, not law, but tradition, should be uh, too old to serve on the standing committee and s should be moved aside. So a lot of people are guessing about whether he will stay on, whether that indicates that Xi Jinping will stay on. Because there's so little we really know, it's silly season for predictions. But the real questions are still the long-term questions about China, how it addresses modernity, whether it can continue to open up, and whether this sclerotic Leninist system, again, Cold War for a poor, agrarian, revolutionary country, how it can possibly serve the needs of the far more dynamic China we see today. These are the pressures that she has to deal with. Those are the big questions we should be asking about the Congress. Questions moving forward that will affect the rest of our lives, whether we live in China Absolutely. or not. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, Robert, thank you. This was like a, a textbook in five minutes, a terrific uh, presentation. Well, thank you. Thanks very much.